Welcome to Harlow on Healthcare. I'm David Harlow, and I invite you to join me by my virtual hearth as I sit down with healthcare leaders to discuss building the future of healthcare. Today, my guest is Dr. Ben Cantor, Chief Medical Information Officer of Vocera, which enables care teams to communicate and collaborate in real time. Welcome, Ben, and thanks for joining us. Thank you, David. Very happy to be here and to speak with you. So I know that you've worked both in the healthcare provider sector and on the vendor side of the house over the course of your career. Can you give us a sense of what some of the key differences might be between those two kinds of roles? Sure. So I I was in private practice as a pulmonary critical care physician and uh, was was not in an academic center. As I moved up through the ranks and shared departments and became chief of staff and eventually CMIO for our organization, I began to realize that it was really all about providing systems of care. And as I moved over to the vendor side, it's been very similar. It's really about building systems to support the clinicians in their day-to-day work. I think one of the major differences between working at a hospital and working on the vendor side is that when you're a hospital-based CMIO, you're spread very thin, very widely across multiple different projects. You get pulled into almost everything, and you can't get very deep. One of the advantages, I think, of being on the vendor side is that you get a chance to get very, very deep in one area that hopefully is of you know, great interest to you. When I first left the hospital, the ability to get very deep into an area of clinical medicine that I was fascinated by was something I would never have had a chance to do if I was working for a hospital. Did you always want to be a CMIO? Is that what you wanted to be when you grew up when you were a kid? Uh, How did you, how did, was that even a thing when you went to medical school? I mean, how did you, how did you know? How did you end up in this corner of the universe? Uh, sort of uh, brownie in motion, <laughs> random, <laughs> random walk. Um, it, it's not quite that random. Uh, no, CMIOs did not exist. CMIOs um, in their present form have really only been around uh, roughly 15 years, and uh, I'm 62. So when I went through training, if somebody had said, what's medical informatics, I think none of us would have even known if that was actually a term at that time. Um, but as you go through your practice, you start to realize that, you know, I was a, I was a, a critical care specialist. So, you know, we, we're dependent on getting the right information as quickly as possible because everything is so time sensitive. Back in 2002, the board of our hospital system decided to replace our predominantly paper medical record and, and move over to an electronic health record. And our CEO asked me to represent the medical staff. Um, And so I wandered into medical informatics, not really knowing what I didn't know as the medical staff representative on that project. Um, And 15 years later, no, 15, it's almost 20 years later, I I look back uh, on that experience and uh, it's quite amazing what's happened over the past 15 years, 15, 20 years. So I know this this wasn't a thing when you were in training, but do you think that there's sufficient focus on health IT or medical informatics in medical schools today? Uh, It's increasing significantly. So now the opportunity to get uh, some basic training in medical informatics during medical school is available. Uh, There's certainly uh, fellowships in medical informatics. You can get Masters in medical informatics. There's training programs across the United States, uh, which can be either attended in person or remotely. Uh, I, I, I think the issues that have been so public over the past five to 10 years regarding the electronic health record has pushed knowledge of medical informatics, uh, at least generally uh, across all medical specialties. So I think everybody's aware of it at this point. Uh, In addition, since we've moved from paper to digital records, there's been a big transition in the role of medical informatics from not just putting in things like the electronic health record, but how do we actually make best use of all of the information that's present? 
Right. That's a huge challenge. I mean, it's one thing to, to wire what we have or, as they say, to pave the cow paths. Uh, and it's another to actually maybe re-engineer processes rather than just paving the cow paths and, and putting the data to good use, to better use. To, and that's really the, the promise, the ultimate promise of the incentives around digitization of medicine. Do you see that starting to pay off? What, what's your sense from where you sit? Yeah, my sense is that it is beginning to pay off. I think what differentiates a successful organization from another is how do you how do you sift through all of that data? And I mean, there's more data than ever because virtually every system that goes into a hospital has the ability to send and record information uh, and populate a database, but uh, it may not interact with other pieces of data. So how quickly can you get that information, um, recognize whether or not it's actionable, and do something with it, is, whether it's operational or clinical, is what you know, brings added value to the organization. Um, I think the days where you record, you get your data, and you send it out to a third party and you get it back a month later just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's kind of like saying, well, what was the traffic pattern a month and a half ago, and is it safe for me to cross the street? Um, I'm not quite so sure that that's the best way to do business. Um, so whether you think about it as a real-time health system or smart hospitals, the ones that are successful, the ones that are efficient, are fighting the same battles the physicians are, and that is how do I get the information about my patients as soon as possible and take action? I think hospitals are making progress. I, at the beginning, when hospitals put in electronic health records, I think it was a very rare enterprise that thought about things like having a data warehouse and employing data scientists or folks that were trained to analyze the data. And years later, you, you saw hospitals starting to layer in um, a third party data warehouse, but without really the knowledge or infrastructure to, to take advantage of it. And so the role of CMIO in the hospitals has been changing. Um, now that the hospitals all have their electronic health records, you see CMIOs that have a, a more uh, academic background and more experience in dealing with uh, data analytics. And you see the CMIOs, instead of reporting into IT, reporting to the chief medical officer, reporting to the chief quality officer. So the whole, the whole reason to have a, a CMIO has, has been changing. So tell us a little bit about the, the toolkit that your company brings to the table. I mean, I'm my my uh, you know man on the street vision of Osera is is focused on the you know Star Trek next generation uh, communicator badge thing that you have brought to market, and I know there's a lot of other stuff behind that and around that. I'm wondering if you could give us a sense of, of what what are sort of the suite of services and products that you have on offer that can sure. bridge bridge the gap from um, old old health IT to new health IT. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Vocera um, has, for uh, essentially two decades now, uh, brought to market a, a unique purpose built device that, as you say, looked like a a Star Trek badge that would provide hands free communications which was originally primarily used by nurses within hospitals. And before we had things like Alexa or Siri or Hey Google, it offered a conversational user interface and a lack of dependency on a traditional phone number. So I could tap my communication badge um, and simply say, call David Harlow. You no longer have a reliance on traditional phone numbers. So I can call someone by name. Uh, called David Harlow. I could call somebody by their role, call nursing supervisor, without having to call the PBX operator and get patched through. So it was really a way of making much more efficient communications point to point. From there, it evolved into developing a supporting application that could run on smartphones that did essentially the same thing. So we have a full suite that runs on iOS or Android. And in fact, over the past five years, have really pivoted the company away from the focus on an endpoint device and really to become a full communication and collaboration platform. So what does that mean, you know, in reality? So we provide secure texting, 
We provide all of the alarm integrations and the workflows associated. As an example, uh, we integrate with almost 150 different hospital systems. Well, why would a communication system need to do that? Well, you have, uh, here's, here's an example. A patient is getting out of bed, so your bed has the ability to send an alarm. But the bed only knows that the patient's trying to get out. It doesn't know anything about the patient. The information about the patient is stuck in the electronic health record. We can pull information from the electronic health record, like the patient's fall risk. Plus yeah, the, patient. the patient not be getting out of bed, right? Exactly. How, what's their risk? Match that with that information. We can then take information from the care team assignment, which nurse is assigned to that patient. And so if the patient is at really no risk of getting out of bed and it's fine, we don't have to send an alarm at all. We can silence that alarm at the bed. If the patient is at high fall risk, we can send a high risk, you know, a high uh, priority alarm to that nurse specific to that patient. And if that patient, uh, let's say, is morbidly obese, we could send that same alarm to a group of nurses instead of just to one. So we can customize the alarm to the patient. And we can only do that because we integrate with multiple systems. So again, besides basic voice texting, we also provide that last mile workflow for all of these event-driven communications. And in most most communications in healthcare is event-driven. Something has occurred that requires the attention of one or more members of the healthcare team. They, in turn, may need to take action. So our whole purpose is to shorten that time to act, um, clean up the confusion, act as a central mediator of all of these alarms and alerts, uh, and, and reduce interruption fatigue. There's just, you know, it's a, a cacophony of, of sounds and messages because in most hospitals, they don't have a communication uh, and collaboration platform. And as a result, each one of these individual systems starts pinging clinicians. They, it starts pushing out information. And it doesn't know, for example, that a nurse may be at a code blue. And it's really not appropriate to interrupt that nurse for Tylenol. Perhaps that message needs to go to somebody else. So by running all of that information through us, we can then distribute the workflow. If you're just tuning in, this is Harlow on Healthcare, coming to you on Healthcare Now Radio. I'm David Harlow, and my guest today is Ben Cantor, CMIO of Ocera. Ben, so from your perch today, what can you tell us about what it takes to get physicians to participate in change management. In, in what does it take to get a group of physicians to participate in what is undoubtedly a disruptive project when you're implementing one of your systems at their hospitals? How do you how do you bridge the gap between the disruption in the present with the promise for some improvement in the future? That's yeah, an excellent question. Um, I think, you know, many folks feel that physicians um, are technology or technologically averse. I don't think that's true. I, I don't think that physicians um, dislike technology. Physicians dislike change. And I think rightfully so. It gets back to pranam non no care, first do no harm. Um, you get taught to operate a certain way. Um, you don't want to see that changing every few weeks it really becomes very difficult to practice. And it's the same thing with the electronic health record where you may have documentation requirements that change. It, it, it's very hard for physicians to adapt. Um, in our case, we actually make everybody's lives easier. So this is not a disruptive uh, technology. What Bocera provides uh, is really more of what physicians are probably used to in their private lives. That is, they are used to texting. Uh, but hospitals may not offer it. Or if hospitals offer texting, um, the doctors are probably using 10 different kinds of texting solutions, some of which may or may not be HIPAA compliant. But if everybody's on their own different communication solution, you really have a chaotic environment. So we simplify things. We actually don't make things harder. Um, so for us, it's easier. I think speaking as a CMIO, I think there are some general principles, though. 
for technology projects when you're going to do them at a hospital. And the first is to recognize that clinical technology projects are clinical. They're clinical just like a scalpel's clinical, and they're used by clinicians in the care uh, of patients. And just like a scalpel, they can be used and enhance care, or they could be misused and hurt care. So you may sell to the IT department, but you need clinical IT leadership from the beginning. So I think involving physicians, involving nurses, involving your clinical team at the very outset of these projects is absolutely critical. So you need that sort of bottom-up, user-driven uh, leadership. There's got to be a what's in it for me. And then you have to have top-down leadership that is consistent uh, and is present throughout these projects. It takes good footwork from the beginning of a project. It's, it's very hard if you start off on the wrong path uh, to get good adoption. You may get implementation. You may get training. But you won't get adoption. Right. You touched on something that, that was sort of the tip of my tongue. The question is, what's, what's the front door? for you as a vendor? Is it through the business office or is it through a clinical office? And I, I imagine it's uh, some of both, but uh, you certainly need clinician buy-in in order for something like this to work. But uh, is the first stop still in a traditional IT shop at a hospital or are you now able to talk CMIO to CMIO in order to, to bring something into a new facility, into a new customer? It's, it's evolving. Uh, we're a very large platform and we do a number of different things. So uh, to some degree, it depends on the site and what they're trying to accomplish. If there's a hospital that's saying, gosh, uh, we aren't sure whether our nurses should be using a smartphone or one of the Vocera smart badges, um, that may be a primarily IT focused uh, discussion initially. But more and more, we're seeing RFPs that are coming uh, from or being led by CMIOs, CNIOs, um, or are being uh, pushed by the CNO or CMO of an organization. I, I think there is more and more recognition that the people doing the communication are your clinical staff for the most part, and if they're unhappy, then everybody's unhappy. Right, um, you right. <laughs> yeah, you, you still do see some IT shops that are running the show because someone has told them, well, we need a HIPAA compliant text messaging solution. So they want to slap something in as cheap and fast as possible. And, and that's fine. There's, there's, you know, 135 plus vendors of secure texting. You could probably build a secure texting solution in your garage in about a week, but it won't get you any added value. It really doesn't do anything other than check a regulatory box. So it doesn't advance healthcare. So how do you, as CMIO, help uh, add, add value to the company, to these products? And how do you see the opportunity for hospital or medical center CMIOs to, to, to add value? Uh, I, I imagine it's, it, it's beyond just identifying what the, what the solution is going to be. It's, uh, it's much broader than that. I wonder if you could speak to that again. It is. Um, I think that as physicians think about what their roles are, it remains clinical. My value to Vocera, which is uh, a mid-sized public company, or the startup that I was with, with before, or even in my role as CMIO at the hospital system where I was at, is understanding systems of care, uh, systems and delivery of care. Um, if if you think you're going to go do this and become uh, you know help code, you'd be the most expensive code or the 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 vendor ever ever hired. Um, there's a lot of really terrific, super talented coders that are out there. They don't need physicians to become engineers. That's not our value. We bring value by recognizing and representing the voice of the clinician. That's that's the that's the simplest and most basic, but it's also trying to say, if we're going to find a solution, how do we build a solution that isn't, that, it, that, you, that you take more of a strategic view of it rather than a tactical view? You bring added value to your organization when you find a solution that you can 
grow with, that can grow with you, that can take your organization up a notch from where it is today. So in our case, if you're going to put in a communication solution, you want a communication solution that can support everybody in the organization, that can integrate with all of your uh, uh, clinically and operationally significant systems, that has the right reporting and analytics, um, that can grow and evolve and continue to support the hospital enterprise and the clinics you know, for decades to come. CMIO is, you know, plays an integral role in, in that process. Plus, you know, the fun thing about being a CMIO, I've been working in communications for about 15 years now, is innovation. When you're surrounded by really talented engineers, um, you can make a lot of good things happen. It, it's, it's a lot of fun, and it's very exciting. That's great. So we've uh, touched on and danced around a little bit uh, EHRs. Now, EHRs, in many respects, are seen as being a, a really good thing. It's uh, the sort of the first step in building uh, a health IT uh, ecosystem. A lot of criticism has been leveled at EHRs uh, in the past 10 years. And I'm wondering, you know, where you come down in this debate. Are EHRs really all that bad? Or are they, in fact, you know, useful first step? Are we at a point where everyone needs to rip and replace what they used to use and develop something new? Or, or can we just use that as a foundation and layer other tools on top, plug in other tools that can help us do things? I think the EHR gets a bad rap in, in most cases. Um, I, I practiced uh, in a 100% paper environment, hybrid environment, where everything's paper with the exception of labs, which you look at on a screen, and then conversion to essentially full uh, digital record. The, the second piece is that when people refer to the EHR, they tend to refer to the EHR monolithically, as if all parts of the EHR are equal. Um, I think nobody would disagree that being able to look at my radiology images anywhere, anytime in full patient context has been nothing but, you know, an outstanding success. On the other hand, people would say that, gosh, documenting in the EHR or letting the EHR tell me the patient's story has been much less of a success. I personally go back to the first days of the modern uh, patient-centric EHR 15, 20 years ago. And I think a lot of the issues we're dealing with today and a lot of the things that cause headaches and burnout for physicians and nurses alike stems from the original environment in which these things were developed. And that had to do with the fact that the monitors were limited to 15 to 18 inches uh, diagonally. And, I, and you don't see that talked about much. But uh, I actually, <laughs> at one point, uh, measured how much landscape information was available to physicians when they were working in a hybrid environment. And you often, you had your chart open, you could see your progress notes, you could, you could have a separate page to write your orders, you had another screen that was up that had your labs, and you had your trifold flow sheet that had, you know, all of the physiology for the patient for 24 hours. That was all open. Your eye could take it in all at one time. You weren't clicking behind pages to get from one thing to the other. And you could work the way physicians work, which is not linearly. Physicians have a very interrupted workflow. It's not a linear workflow. I, I could look in my labs, see that there's an abnormal lab, let's say a high potassium, immediately document that, at the same time write orders to fix it and move on to the next lab. When we converted over to electronic health records, we shrunk all of that information. That was about 350 square inches of information and smushed it all down to a 15-inch diagonal screen, which is maybe 100 square inches. I think that was a huge issue. You could do it today on a 30-inch screen. If I was building an EHR today, I'd start with a 30-inch screen and re-envision the entire process. You know, that's, Brad, that's, these days, I can't imagine working with fewer than two screens going at once. <laughs> that's right. And, and, and given the vast amount of information for the patients that are in the hospital, to think that we could actually manage them, because some folks have said, well, all you need is a smartphone. That's craziness. You, you can't view a battlefield through a keyhole. 
and you can't get the data, you can't see the data, visualize it, and get a sense of what's going on with the patient by looking at little individual chunks of data on a very tiny uh, interface. It, it just doesn't work. The long answer to the electronic health record, I, I think the biggest problem with the electronic health record is the fact that it's digital, and that's not a bad thing. I now People forget that when you used to go up to a floor and round, if the surgical team had the chart and you're on a medical team, you couldn't round on the patient. You didn't have access to the information. That's gone away. Now 100 different people can be looking at the record at the same time. But on the other hand, the fact that it's digital means that it can change. It means that somebody can change the way, the look and the feel. They can change the tool overnight. So I go back to, you know, first do no harm. It's not just first do no harm to the patient. It's also first do no harm to the caregiver. Imagine if you're a surgeon and every few weeks when you got to the OR, your surgical tools were changed. You'd go crazy. Well, it's the same thing with the electronic health record. You know, every few months, somebody's changed something. There's been an upgrade. It doesn't look the same. It's a different look and feel. And now I have to learn to do my daily work differently. We're not giving our clinicians a chance to rest to just take a deep breath and work in an efficient way that they like to do it. To wrap things up, uh, Ben, I'll, I'll end with my lightning round final question, which is if you were to wake up tomorrow and find yourself five years in the future, what's one thing in healthcare that you would hope or maybe expect to find has changed dramatically? The great unicorn of interoperability in the sense that all of my information is available to whoever needs it, whenever they need it. I'd like to see the electronic health records be opened up in the same way that applications like Photoshop are opened up so that folks that are innovators can add third-party apps on and make better and better use of the tools that are there on the electronic record of the data that's there. You have been listening to Harlow on Healthcare. Join us at healthcarenowradio.com. Let's continue the conversation on building the future of healthcare together at hashtag Harlow on HC. I'm David Harlow, keeping the fire going and holding a seat open for you. Until next time.